please join me in welcoming both of them. If I don't have the microphone in my hand like this, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, I mean, the people who are filming, I'm very sorry. <laughs> uh, how are you? Oh my god, the audience is like filled with like really good friends of mine. <laughs> I mean like people who knew me from before I had like great pubes. <laughs> I mean lesbians with whom I have had like, you know, um, questionable experiences. <laughs> you know, um, they're, 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 can I can I load your hope tongue? Yes, you can. This hope tongue, raise your hand and wave. <laughs> when I came out on campus at the University of the West Indies, hope tongue was the only person, other than myself, that other people were kind of sure that he might be gay. <laughs> so he was the only one, and he was so gay. <laughs> still am. Like, and he, st he still am. <laughs> decided that he, he doesn't need to um, un-gay himself, <laughs> even after coming to America. And coming to America is difficult, you know. Many people I meet, especially in the queer community, uh, you're often of, the, expre of the, um, the, the impression that when we come here, we're just kind of frolicking in the gay meadows of New York <laughs> freely. But you know, there's a bit about us that might be difficult, you know, we're kind of black. <laughs> And you, you know now that they've started to shoot us through our own windows now. Yes. You're aware of this? Yes. Yes, I want to ask the white people if you're aware. And have you connected with your cousins in the South? Have you talked to your cop friends who are like friends of yours? Have you talked to your cousins? Because this is the only way this is going to stop, you know. I mean, this should be the friendly part of the evening. I should be doing sex poems to make you like me first before I attack you about race. So I'm aware that I'm jumping the gun, but I am so deeply distressed by where we are um, that it's hard to like craft the, you know, like the massage, like the pre, what do you call it? The, um, foreplay. <laughs> it's like hard to come by if you love it. <laughs> Poor metaphor. Okay, so Nicole and I, you know, I, the, uh, when they're doing this reading, I was like, oh, they're like, who you, who you want to do this reading with? Somebody queer, maybe somebody Jamaican. I'm like, okay, there's like, you know, four of us. <laughs> and there's only one other, like, woman who's out here, like, with the queer, the Q stamp on our forehead, like me. And I had the L before the Q. Because you know, I mean, those of us with great cubes, um, we we had we have been L for a long time, and then like young people come and be like, "Fuck you, we don't want L." <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be Q, motherfuckers, and we're like, "Okay, um, all right." <laughs> Since you're young, so we mutter to ourselves in closed rooms. These motherfuckers come with this fucking cute. <laughs> We're hell, right? L! And we chant L secretly in our bedrooms. <laughs> and then we smile at you when we come out and we're like, yeah, QLs we are, QLs. <laughs> Trying to make nice, but really, like, we're resisting the Q a lot because we want to be like, yes, we have vaginas and we like other vaginas! And we don't want to be called essentialists. <laughs> but, so we're Q too! <laughs> with it, you know, I mean, you know, back problems and high cholesterol <laughs> and great pubes. We are in deep struggle with you, young ones. But, you know, guide us, you know, like, you know, hold our hands, you know, and make us feel like we are important because we kind of are. Because y'all couldn't be here, like, queuing out the motherfucking queue all day long unless we were Elling before you. And, <laughs> and we'll be here when we are 70, and then when the people come and be like, there is no letter! <laughs> and then you will be in small rooms with us, <laughs> muttering like, you know, we always had a letter! <laughs> Even if it was different, we had a letter! And then these young people will be like, there is no letter! No letter! We are now like, an equal sign. We are all equal signs. In fact, I'm only the top half of the equal sign. So we'll be here, you know, because we take it our cholesterol.
electoral pills <laughs> and will be around long enough to hear you motherfuckers <laughs> moan and bitch about the disappearance of the alphabet. <laughs> of things beautiful for me. Becoming woman has always been the center of my girlhood. The sum of my thighs, my ankles, even my shoulders were always girl. And when I bled for the first time, I told my best friend, wrapped my secret in her ear, assured her that this blood meant that we could make babies. But being a girl in Jamaica in 1980 meant I had to run faster than my cousin's fingers, farther than his sweaty palms reaching for my hands. My tiny breasts had to be brave against his fury when I refused. One night, I stabbed him, pencil point sliding swift into his flesh. The whole house cried out. And I was so proud of my yellow pencil, point sharp and without fear. My aunt beat me anyways. For making your cousin bleed, she said. And I cried more out of loneliness than anything. The other cousin's name still remains quiet upon my tongue. I think of him when I am sad or angry or afraid of things that do not make noises in the dark. Stark raving mad, he showed me his dick told me, you smell like a woman in that little girl's body. Hips barely budding, he cornered me in the hallway, in the bathroom, and when I bled, I washed quick and quiet. Years later, he still smiles at me. Even now, no apologies necessary. I was only a girl. Quick and quiet, girls learn to wash the details away, bury them on the briefs, jeans, cargo pants. Under these panties rest the stories of these chochas, these twats, these bushes that bleed on time. Once a month, and I wrote this poem before I had a kid, once a month I'm reminded that though I have not yet given birth, I can. My pussy can do something no dick or tomcat can. I dare you to make people without a vagina. Shiva or man or beast. I mean, even Jesus had to pass through a punani. <laughs> Angels and messengers aside, Mary had to lend passage to God. Or then Christians might still be Jews, <laughs> waiting for a Christ that was stuck up the ass of some man who thought he could do what little girls are forced to do in Sri Lanka and Uganda and South Carolina every day against our wishes. We carry common stories of sons and fathers and cousins who violate the sanctity of these bodies, these breasts, this ability to make breath from passion or the neat decision of an intent. One day, I hope my belly will bloom little miracles called Andrea or Elisha or Alexandra. I hope the mouths will open wide in wonder and terror every day Men ponder the magic of what vaginas do. Every day, women carry people into being. And every day, even on the most petrifying day, I stand grateful I was born. Bloody snatch in just the right place today. I'm so glad I'm a girl. Especially because yesterday, my mother told me, go ahead and write your story. No matter that I will write her in unflattering truths. Write, she told me. And I hope the book sells so you can afford to raise the daughter with a heart <laughs> like yours and everything was better between us. It didn't matter that she left me twice. No matter that in Jamaica in 1972 and in 1980, she chose her safety over mine. Yesterday, my mother said, write my daughter and the world righted itself. I wish every mother whose daughter survived the burial of unspoken things would give her permission to say what happened to write down how she endured the terror of being that small girl in a world that so deeply favors large, brutal men. I wish every cunt had the courage to bear public witness. I wish every woman had a pen, a clear view, and the support she needs to scream. What happened to me was not my fault. What happened to me was not my fault. What happened to me was not my fault. I have a haiku from my mother also, um, it goes, haiku from my mother. Chinaman left her, black child in her flat belly, rock, stone in her heart. 
um, it's an interesting thing to navigate one's mother. You know, um, I don't know how many of you are Caribbean in here. I know quite a few. Raise your hand if you're Caribbean. Raise, a, raise them if you're immigrant. Yeah. Raise them if your mother was an immigrant. We're here. There we go. In, in thick, 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 thick presence. So you know what it requires to move from one country to the next. And when you have no money to move from one country to the next. And when you have no resources. And when you don't necessarily have the language of the place in your mouth. And you don't have a, like a support system to walk into. My mother is one of them sorcerers, right? <clears throat> now, my mother has the reputation of being a liar from she was a small girl. She always told stories, things that were not so. So she told a lot of lies when she was young. And so when she ended up pregnant twice, and the men said that she was a liar, everyone sided with the men and said, oh, she must be lying because she had always told lies. Also, when she came to the US and she was kind of living undocumented and going through, I mean, nobody knows exactly what happened with my mother. My mother left Jamaica when she was, I mean, she had me at 23. Um, she was about to turn 24 the March. I was born Christmas and she would have turned 24 the March, but she was gone by the end of February. Or like, she, was, she left the island. She left me with my grandmother in January and then she left the island. No one knew exactly when she left. And no one knew exactly why she left. Like, did she leave because she met a tourist man on the beach in Montego Bay and this man said to her, come to Canada with me and I'm going to marry you? Or did, she, did the man say, come and be my nanny? But there's a million stories tied up in it. Like, one of the streams of the stories is that she went to Canada to, um, and we don't know if it's Montreal or Toronto she went to, but she left and she ended up in Toronto. She ended up in Montreal um, and something happened. It, the man who invited her had a, a, had a, had a wife and he, she was expected to be the nanny and my mother had to leave and just, I'm not quite sure exactly, but that is one story. The other story is that she met the man, the man wanted to marry her, but then she couldn't, she didn't believe that if she told him she had two children, he would still want to marry her. So she left. So I think of it, about it like a, a woman who is in a burning building and either she can save herself or she can stay and burn with the two children. And what, a, what an awful choice to have to make. And so my mother chose to save herself and she left us in Jamaica. Um, and then when she ended up in Canada for a while, she was telling all these lies about who she was. So she would say to people, yes, I'm going to London for the weekend. Or yes, I'm going to Copenhagen for a week. And so when I landed in America 25 years later, and uh, two years, within two years of being here, I was on Broadway and I was going to Copenhagen for the weekend and I was going to London for a week to, for work. And I would say this to my relatives like, yo, they would say to me, oh, you're coming to the christening? And I'd be like, no, I'm not coming because I'm going to London for the weekend. They would be like, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't catch the child as well. <laughs> so I'm in a Broadway show, so we're on, we're on the street and we're in this show and, uh, our faces are on buses, those of you who are, you know, old enough to remember <laughs> when the deaf poetry was on, our faces were on buses and in the subways. And so my aunt called me one day and be like, Jesus Christ, you give me a heart attack, what are you doing on a bus? <laughs> and I, I said to her, I tell you, I'm in the show that we're on a, she said, everybody think you was lying like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but my mother, my mother's lies have become true for me in this weird kind of way. Like I'm living all the lies that she talked about, you know. Um, anyways, uh, I'm going to read like two more poems quickly and then we're going to get Nicole up here into the mix because we have to take off here. Yes, but I haven't seen you in years. <laughs> oh, I must know that you cut off your hair. She does come and just sit down in front of me and just <laughs> perplex me. <laughs> I don't understand you. 
So, um, you asked me to read On Becoming 30 and you asked yes. me to read My Jamaica. Yeah. So I'm going to read those two and then we're going to jump in the conversation. All right. And if you don't have Nicole's book, you must buy them right now because they're very hot and sexy. And um, a straight man from Jamaica texted me in the middle of the night to say, you know, you know Nicole Dennis Ben? <laughs> relevant at one in the morning. You will ask one lesbian if you know the other lesbian in your desire in the middle of the night. It just don't seem like a, a winning strategy. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, you know, apparently you're very hot and sexy and all the straight men in Jamaica are dying to meet you. And they're texting all the lesbians to see <laughs> if they can reach you. So go ahead and mess up. Go ahead and mess up. <laughs> My Jamaica. I will read this one for Nadine and for Allison and for Hopeton and for um, Nicole and for Chris. Is it Chris? Uh, the, the, all of the little Jamaican lesbians in the room who we have struggled for so long to call a place our own. And you know, Carmen, you're sort of Jamaican. <laughs> For you too. My Jamaica. My love affair with Jamaica has always been double-edged. Two ends of a pimento candle burning towards a slender middle. The indulgent heat pushing me off center. On this island, there has never been safe ground. The flat cut of ligony contrasts with the fluid shape of indigo mountains. Gordon Town frames the blue-black faces cleaning dirty windscreens on Hope Road, the hunger in their eyes, eerie at twilight, the dead breathing wistful flames at night. Rolling across childhood memories, the raspy sound of my brother's breathing reminds me that I must never rest. The uneven iron bed wasn't big enough to hold my dreams, my fears sweating through the polyester nightgown. Water will always find its own level, my grandmother whispers. Sleep now before the new day come find you still looking into yesterday. Jamaica has always been harsh. Hard words of rigid correction connecting with the side of my head. Two fingers of water above the rice. Turn down the fire when the pot start boiling. And Gal Pitney must learn to wash them under clothes. The white uniforms they hit the welts on my legs. The blue ties tempered the Catholic purity. Soft sister hands encouraged the metal rosary. B plus was never acceptable in math. You want to sell cigarettes on the roadside? Finish your homework and come get a piece of corn meal pudding. The land has always been lush. Coconut husks split open to the rush of a moody sea. Sunday afternoons on the endless sand, pre-adolescent belly bottoms slipped to reveal the red fruit, pulpy sweet but angry in captivity. Jamaica has always loved me from a place of random beauty. Women with wide cassava hips and full star apple lips. Women with strong hands reaching beyond their own fears to give their children courage, teaching them to stand straight back in the absence of fathers who visit with the smell of white rum in their words. My father has never loved women with soft hands. My mother will show you the scars, still wrapped around her solid middle, banning her belly tight against the visibility. This child will never be silent. I speak now because my grandmother gave me tongue. I speak now because Jamaica has always given me crosses I will have to bear alone. The only compass, my mother's needle sharp pain, shooting proud across my back, marked like a crab. Jamaica has always been able to find me, a thorn among the bloody hibiscus blooms. My Jamaica has always been the hardest poem to write. So one more to go out to go and then we'll we'll start the talk. We're going to talk the things up in the air. <laughs> My friends always tell me that um, I've always been one who's reaching to be older than I want to be. So um, I'm 46 now, so I tell people, oh yeah, I'm almost 50. <laughs> and um, I remember I wrote this poem when I was maybe 27, and it's called On Becoming 30. <laughs> <laughs> 
And when I was young, I wanted to be old so much. But now, <laughs> you know, I look at my pubes and they're just not as robust in the coloring <laughs> as they used to be. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I look at them and I think like, whose pussy is this? <laughs> not mine. I mean, my pussy is dark and full of mystery. <laughs> and this one is just like, you know, and I hear that after they go gray, they fall out. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can't imagine what kind of poem I'm going to write when I start. <laughs> I tell people like, listen, you, you, you should have seen them in my <laughs> But on becoming 30 for the L's in the room. <laughs> With the hope that the Q's will continue to be kind. <laughs> because your day is motherfucking coming. <laughs> I didn't think that I was going to get old too. I used to look at my boobs going like, that shit is not falling ever. <laughs> like my nipples used to just stick me in the eye. Just me walking. <laughs> just be like, if I don't look down, they're like in the eye. You know what I mean? And then. Now they're like so friendly with my knees. <laughs> First name basis and shit. But here we are, you know what I mean? Would you trade smoother skin, perkier breasts, a more limber body for the wisdom you've gained? No. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> for as long as I can remember who I was as an adult. Hope Town, we used to be under the, the, the tree Three. talking all kind of foolishness. We just were adults, you know, just like, yes, we're feminists, we're radicals. Don't even know what the fuck radical means, but we're radical. And uh, all my life, I've been upset, just mad at construction workers calling to me. The fuck are you calling to me for? Don't you dare say hello to me. I don't need you to tell me I'm beautiful. Thank you very much. The first day I walk by a construction site and nobody said anything, I come back around. Me. Why are they not asking me so that I might resist it? But this is the complication of the patriarchy, right? We have no fucking idea what exactly is happening. Like we're like, oh my god, is this internalized shit? Is this a real concern? Oh my god, like this, I mean, my boobs are almost all out and this construction worker is saying nothing to me, nothing. He's not looking at me at all. Maybe I should dance when I go by. Anyways, on becoming 30. I am inching into 30 and my body thickens. Don't laugh, my friends laugh. I am inching into 30 and my body thickens, a lyric of many measures. The chorus inside me swells to meet my grandmother's stoic silence. Her hips have always been wider than mine, wider than my mother's. Under the influence of a distant song, our footprints depress the earth in different time zones. The collective, visible only in fragments. People and places no one knows anymore. I am affected by women who age beautifully. Women who sing off key in public places, in bathrooms. In the absence of fathers and dead sons, the women in my family ingest convention like duty. Sacrifice is the only way we know how to say, I love you to our daughters. In my small world, Mama Lou begat Bernice, who begat Hazel, who begat me before she was forced to flee the barbed wire of poverty, long hours laboring for someone else's children. She sacrificed her own for a chance beyond the ordered nature of things. Tradition makes it impossible to pave a pathway if you are a woman, if you choose not to wear the dress rehearsal of wife. In some places, husband is just another way to write warden on the walls constructed around little girls. My mother chose her own freedom. And if I were not so busy being left behind, I would play the drums for the price of her liberty. I would tell you of her nights spent tossing in strange beds, hollow panels for headboards, dark halls echoing the names she would spend three decades trying to forget. The smell of Julie Mangles 
still remind her of her mother. She buckles under my anger. Forgiveness extends to her only through my German sister who knows nothing of Jamaica, 90 miles off the coast of Castro's Cuba. These women have always walked ahead of me, hope moving their children towards a dream of this America where people will do anything to get a US visa. And still I grow older. Four gray hairs shoot silver from my scalp. I am beginning to look like my grandmother. Only I dance visibly out of step with time as we know it. Loop my arms around the faces that refuse to see me. In tribute to Louise and Bernice who stayed. I raise my fist for me, for my mother, who had the courage to leave. The lack of words between us reminds me I come from a line of women with dark scars for last names. Women who sing in secret chorus across blue waters. Women who are quick to tell me time has always been longer than rope. These women teach me to play my own part in this endless song. That one gets me all the time. I mean, so I had the, the I have the privilege of interviewing Stacey and Shin. I've known of Stacey and Shin since 2003 or yeah, no 2001. Yeah, you come to the past, like no, before that, even before that, before that. So I came to America in '99, and apparently it was the same year that you came to America. Yes, we but came here. right, what month you came? In well, um, August actually. August so, when you remember the date? August day? 15. I came the 20th. The tw what? Yes. Oh my God. All right. So and I flew up from Kingston. Where you fly from? Montego Bay. Kingston. Kingston. Oh, Kingston? Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. So that, that's that's a good okay. So very the similarities are there. Yes. But I, um, so I, I was in college, and I saw the fires all over campus. There's a Jamaican woman coming, a poet, and you know this big, big time poet coming to, speak to, um, you know, to, to perform. So I saw that she's Jamaican, and but I didn't know anything else about her. Only that she's Jamaican. So I went. Right? It was a room like this one. It was actually crowded. Um, it was like in the cafeteria at um, Cornell. And Stacey and like how, what she just did just now, the set blew us away with her poetry. She blew me away. I was like in awe and it, the first of all in awe that one she's Jamaican so I saw that connection there first and foremost and then lesbian she said the magic L. word lesbian L right and I mean I was like coming out to myself at the time so of, of course I was thinking I was like the only Jamaican lesbian in our culture I was feeling alone and then here comes Stacey and with, in the audience like I'm a lesbian you know like she gave a great performance and I've never felt so proud and also the fact that you know no, I no longer felt alone Right, you know James Baldwin saying, you know, you think you're alone in the world until you open a book. Uh, for Stacey and Shane, it was her words that moved me. You know, I don't think I've ever really read it until here, with Crossfire, which is why I value this book so much because she has compiled all of them. And I'm gonna know. Um, get into this because first of all you know what you just um, mentioned what you just um, said in terms of your poetry and also what I read is like being human and I saw sister Sonia Ch Sanchez I'm going to read this quote Stacey and Chin recaptures reminds us that we must answer that most important question if we're not like if we're if we were to live, what does it mean to be human? And that's exactly what your poems are, you know, how honest they are. And I want to actually just, t before you even get into the party too, you know, get into the process, because I've always been curious about your process in terms of writing your different identities on the page. Um, when you're sitting down to write a poem, you know, like what, what comes out first? And then how do you like, you know, um, go, go, along, go along with that? I think um, the first thing that comes, that first line, I mean, I don't know, how, there are other writers in the room, so I'm not sure how it works. But if I don't have the first line of a poem, even if I have the rest of the poem happening in my head, I can't put it to paper yet. Mm. But once I get that first line, it's like, okay, you're on the GP, maybe it's like the GPS, right. and you kind of know that is like upper Manhattan, sort of. So, but until you know exactly where, where, you, where to begin, you're kind of like lost and not quite sure where to go. So the minute, um, you know, there's a poem in there called um, Not My President, where I talk about Donald J. Trump yes. not being my president. And, you know, I, I remember the moment when I, 
when I actually was in, an, in front of an audience and I stepped to the microphone and I got the urge to say, Donald J. Trump is not my president. And the poem begins, every time I step to a microphone, I get an uncontrollable urge to shout, Donald J. Trump is not my president. Um, you know, even this poem, like I'm inching towards 30. Like, you know, there's a, lots of conversation about my getting older. Um, even the, the title poem is called Crossfire. It's like, am I a feminist or a womanist? The kid asked me that and then immediately the rest of the poem tumbled out. Mm. And I mean, the first write isn't always good. You know that already. Right, yeah. You know, I mean, That's editing good. is like the, how the thing happens. I mean, Many people walk around thinking that you just write a poem and it's just amazing. Like, you know, 90% of the work that you do with a poem or a book is really just the editing and the editing and the editing. Um, but I keep telling people that if the world were immediately right and everything was equal and we didn't have any, like, you know, white supremacist white people and we didn't have any ableist and we didn't have any racist and we didn't have any all of the ists, like, I wouldn't know what to do with myself because I wouldn't know what to write because I write from a place of the reason I write is to try to make things right. I don't write from a, I don't, you know, mountains don't move me except to like climb them or to lie down in the water in the river. But I'm not one to sit on a no damn beach and like, oh, it's so beautiful right. here. I must write a poem about a beach. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Right. It's true. But make a woman tell me that she don't want to date me on the beach. Then there's a whole poem coming right now. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, I remember um, we had a phone conversation before this panel, and I was actually venting to Stacey and Ching, because I was actually on a panel um, back in Decatur and with another poet who was like, oh, yeah, I only write when I'm you know, calm. You know, I don't write when I'm angry. And I told Stacey, and she's like, what? Then clearly he's not a black woman, uh, first and foremost. And I feel like you know, as um, marginalized people in society, we're writing against something, right? Like even when I'm, sit I'm sitting to write, it has to be against something. So for me, you know, to read your work and each point hit me, you know, first of all, as, as a woman, as a Jamaican, as a lesbian. I'm not going to say no qu the queer word, because I had queer written here. I was like, lesbian. Um, and also, you know, this by virtue of growing up at home, right? And, you know, your poems express this, but, you know, you mentioned My Jamaica was the hardest you poem to Jamaica. write in Vineyard Town. Right, which is, yeah. you know Jamaica enough to know where Vineyard Town is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alice really raising her hand. So, you know, my Jamaica is the hardest poem to write. And, you know, I felt that poem, Stacian, to the core. Because, you know, we also connect as artists, we connect as Jamaican women writers who are also gay or lesbian. And, you know, the acceptance at, at home. Like, how, how has Jamaicans responded to your poems? I mean, you're here in New York City now, but how has Jamaicans responded Ooh. to your poems? <laughs> I mean, I remember, like, you know, I, I've had performances in Jamaica where they had to, like, you know, hide me in a car to get me out without being, like, beaten up. Um, and I've had per performances where, you know, I've had, like, standing ovations, and I've had performances where people were, like, we're coming to kill her. And when I did a, my Oprah interview, um, Oprah's team called to ask if I felt like they needed to move me because they were receiving like more threats than they were normally used to <laughs> for a show. Um, you know, and, and as I say, like you know, you know, if if a Jamaican create a dance and then the, the the YouTube thing go viral, they get on the front page of the newspaper. But the rest of us, you know, no matter what the hell we do, we can't, you know, because we're gay. Um, but I feel like it's changing a little bit. As I said, the, the young man from the newspaper called me right. in the middle of the night to ask me for your oh number. <laughs> but you know what? It, it, I think it changed, definitely. It, it depends on class, but also as women, too. Because one of the things, too, that we connected on is that, you know, Jamaicans, you know, they, they love their men you know, um, gay or not. And I feel like um, as artists, when, you're, when you want to be accepted by your own country, especially if you're doing great things in the US, the New York Times is saying great things, Oprah is saying great things, but then it's not, um, it's not newsworthy. I mean, right? I, I think it speaks to like how deeply the, um, how deeply the patriarchy you know, infiltrates almost every aspect of who we are and what we do and how problematic um, conversations about the vagina is. Yeah. You know, like when you, you know, a, a part of the reason why a lot of us, you know, old dykes 
And I tell you, the 70 year old dykes I know now, you can't call them dykes because it was a terrible word back in the day. But my generation is like, yeah, you look like a baby dyke and we dykes. And I'm wearing my dyke outfit. Um, but the, 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 every, time you, every time you make central in the conversation, the vagina, the women's body, the, the, the female body, I think people get very, very, very uncomfortable. Um, and the quarrel between like the, the, the older dykes or the older lesbians that I know and the young queer community that wants to move beyond the notion of uh, the body defining who I am, which is a valid struggle and a wonderful uh, desire. You want to be seen for more than what your body is or does. Um, but in a lot of places, I just spent the week, uh, I went to a, an, a, a, a fundraiser to talk about like the, the, the trafficking of women and girls. And if we're not talking about the vagina, if we're not talking about womanhood as prescribed by the patriarchy, if you're not talking about what happens to those bodies, then you leave a, a great number of people who are under severe political um, and socioeconomic distress because they are female. I, I, I tell you this as a, as, a, as a conversation. If I'm gay and I'm being beaten up in Jamaica, I can apply for asylum in Canada or England or you know, America, right? U the US. If I'm poor and I live in a neighborhood and getting beaten up every day and getting raped, there's no asylum for that. You know what I mean? Like there, there isn't like a known you could just say, oh, you, you, can't just, you can't just get a visa and then you're gonna apply for asylum because you are a straight girl who is being raped every day in the community you come from. And it, it speaks to, um, it speaks to like America's desire to demonize other places and to forget that that the patriarchy is here as well. So they don't want to talk about what happens to women because if they talk about what happens to women, they'll have to talk about what happens to women in America as well. But if we are only talking about like, you know, queer people who are you know, set upon violently and are killed in their countries, then it's not America we're talking about. So the conversation is like, uh, it's just really like, oh, we just want to talk about what's happening in Jamaica. We just want to talk about what's happening in Iran and Uganda. And we don't want to talk about the, 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 the great number of people. They don't want to have an intersectional conversation because in an intersectional conversation, you have to discuss all the people who are suffering and then you have to talk about like the immigrants and the cages you, do you know what I mean who wants to talk about that we just want to talk about like people in Uganda who are dying because the people in Uganda are such you know barbaric people then we don't want to talk about like what's happening here um, but I mean I've strayed far from the answer to the question you asked me but I'll, th I'll throw it back to you why you think them don't like we because <laughs> Because, I mean, we're gay, so, but there, there, there are, there are um, you know, I've spoken to like some of the gay men writers as well, and they feel as if they struggle to be loved and accepted by Jamaica. Um, but there's something like, you know, again, when you talk about intersectionality, that in our bodies, we are also, um, we're gay and we claim it outright, and then we are women mm -hmm. and we're black. And it, the subject of our work is right. queer love between women. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people just uncomfortable with that. I mean, I think people are uncomfortable. I think, I think even some women are uncomfortable talking about an entire love story that, sent, that, makes, that, 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 that is exclusive of men. If, if, and, and certainly exclusive, exclusive of white people. So a lot of our work is centered on like what happens to the black queer body, the black female queer body. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think that's hard for people like, you know, I, I could say dick all day and people don't really raise an eyebrow, but if I say vulva or vagina or pussy, people just start getting like uncomfortable, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, I know personally, for example, um, you know, people tend to focus on the, the lesbian aspect, right? So the whole throwing a blanket over really what happens to working class Jamaican women or Jamaican women, period, right, who are marginalized, you know, or girls are being sexualized, and nobody really talks about that. So I really realize that, well, in most interviews here, it's like, oh, yeah, tell me about homophobia in Jamaica. Yes, and nobody wants to talk about, like, uh, sexism because right. if we talk about sexism in Jamaica, we start to look too much like sexism in America. America. Yeah. Um, and nobody wants Same to talk thing. about like the class structure because the class structure starts to look like here. Right. But you know the the the, the 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 gay people being set upon and like beat up and killed. That's not really happening in America in the same way. So it seems foreign enough and make America look good. Um, what our time look like? Eight minutes to Eight do minutes. what? <laughs> to, to, to finish read? this part and then we have to talk to the audience. Okay, so can we just dispense with all of that and just co-create it with the audience? Yeah. All right. All right. Um, yeah, because I think that, you know, I don't know. I'm not that bright, so <laughs> you know it's what? hard to remember what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so I want to also ask you, before you even like, get into that too, like, you know, growing up back home, you know, a lot of us were silenced, right? You, know, so you talk about how, you know, with the, women, the older women or older people used to police our bodies, police our, um, you know, what we say or how we say it. So when exactly did you find your voice? You know, I've always been loud. You know, I'm, I'm glad Hopeton is here. What? <laughs> I'm glad Hopeton is here to bear witness so that, you know, you know <laughs> s s when you shift from one culture to the other, the most wonderful thing is I get so excited in my panties um, when, when, when old friends are here who can co-sign on the thing because, you know, um, black women, immigrants, you know, maybe it's my mother's story that echoes so deeply in my bones mm -hmm. that um, I o I'm always happy when there's, uh, when there's confirmation to a story that I'm telling because we are believed to be liars, mm -hmm. you know, just because of who we are. You know, anytime we're saying anything complicated, you know, we're liars, you know. So if we're raped, we're, we, we're lying. And are we trying to embarrass the man or trying to get money from the man or we, we had asked for it? And, you know, immigrants say this is happening to them. Black bodies say this is happening to them. You know, the, 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 the largely, like, systematic white response is that we're lying. So whenever there are people I've known for years and years in the room and then they can say like, yeah, 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 I remember that story. There's something exciting to me like, oh, see, I tell you, it's true. See, Carmen can tell you, yes, it's true. And Biola can tell you, yes. And Alison and Hopeton and, you know, the, the people in the audience can make me feel like I'm not lying. Um, but, you know, that's maybe therapy time. <laughs> um, or maybe it's like revolution or maybe revolution and therapy. But I, I feel as if... Um, I feel like as if I've always been loud and you know I mean I think when you are born with so little you come out dukes raised and I mean I remember like you know from the time I was four or five years old I'm pushing hands off of me that ought not to be in places on my body that they were um, and, and so in order to just keep breathing I had to fight um, and so I was always a loud kid just like contrary first and then ask questions later. Uh, and and I, th I think that in a weird kind of way, I was always loud and I was always going to be loud. I mean, I remember when I came, when I, when I realized, when it dawned on me that I like vaginas, um, I'm actually like on campus and I just announce it like the night before when I really come to the realization, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna announce it to everybody under the tree tomorrow that yes. You know, you know, no, there was no pussy to be eaten, but I was contemplating it. And if there was anybody who wanted to offer it up, I would be willing to discuss it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because, you know, I'm not getting nothing, but I'm interested. I just need to announce it under the tree. Um, and, but I think that, um, I think that, that when I got attacked by those boys in the bathroom, a dozen boys dragged me into a bathroom and sexually assaulted me on campus. And one of the most surprising things about that, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes in that bathroom was um, that I said almost nothing. I did not scream. I didn't cuss them. I didn't shout back. And um, on top of being so physically injured and so emotionally distraught by the experience, 
I remember being so deeply preoccupied with my, with how silent I had been. And so I was, I didn't want anybody to know that I had been dragged into a bathroom and assaulted and I didn't fight back. Um, because I was so scared and like, I, I, did, I mean, and so I took that secret with me to America. Um, and maybe a few people kind of knew that something terrible had happened because I withdrew from classes. And I'm, you know, I moved from being like a, you know, I was going to get like a, a first class honors and I got a second class honors because I didn't turn in my work. My final thesis just didn't go in on time, which was very unlike me. Um, so, everybody, <laughs> so everybody had this like idea about, you know, like something happened to her at that time. And... Maybe there were rumors, maybe because one or two of the boys had talked about it on campus. Um, and, and that weird silence about that is what now feeds into the maybe it didn't happen. Because, like, did she tell anyone at the time? And uh, did she report it? And because there was none of that, it's like, well, maybe it didn't happen and she just making it up when she got to America because now that's a great story. Um, so, I, I, and I remember landing in America and deciding that I would never be silent again. And, and it was only when I came here and I discovered racism. And I was like, one more fucking shit. I'm not taking this shit. I'm going to be loud. And I'm, I'm going to just grow my hair in the most ridiculous ways. I'm going to wear the clothes that's going to offend people all the time. I'm, you know, like when I walk into a store and they're like, oh, that really looks gorgeous on you. I put it down. I'm not, I'm not interested in the gorgeous clothes. I want to interrupt people's idea of who they think I am and what they think I mean. What this black body coming down the road. I want them to know. That, you know, whatever you think you knew about me, I need to reassess it and come at me with some other conversation. And, and so that is how I, like, put clothes on. This is how I choose to paint up my hair in different colors. This is why, you know, I, I don't wear makeup unless, I mean, I have to. Like, you know, the people that won't put me on the TV unless they paint up my face. But I'm just not the one to go wear no lipstick. I don't want to wear no tight-up clothes. I don't wear no heels. I, you know, like, my friends know that my idea is to interrupt. And I think that comes from that moment of silence. And I think that moment of silence has defined my voice more than, any, more than the, the two decades of noise that I had created beforehand. Because that was normal to me. And what was crazy and crazy and strange was that I was dead silent. And so if you want to get on my wrong side, just question the fact that some woman never said anything about her assault, and now she's saying it. I could stick your eye out with a pencil. I could, like, you know, I mean, like, I get so angry because women don't speak up because of a number of reasons. Um, yeah. yeah, but so, yeah, I, I don't know if I did find, I had voice before, and then I lost it, and then I decided that I would never be silent again, Definitely. I think. Yeah. I should ask you, like, when, when did you come to the, like, okay, I'm going to just write about, about lesbian love and oh my women gosh. kissing up in books and everything? You know what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never even, like, sat down to even think about that. Because when I said, when I, you know, I even had this on, um, to ask you to, because when I sit down and write, it's mostly like just writing a story. Mm -hmm. And then the lesbian aspect just happened to be that. Because, you know, because I've, I'm writing my identity, my identity just happened to pour out on the page. Mm -hmm. You know, some black, being black, being lesbian, being immigrant, all of that come together and they come out in my character my various characters you know so that was how that came about like wanting to express myself but I didn't have a voice in Jamaica um, I wasn't feisty I didn't have um, which brings friend. us to the story how she come to my parties <laughs> right oh god like I used to run these little parties like when I was young and sexy and I had no child <laughs> So I had an apartment in Brooklyn, like, you know, nice little apartment with wood floors and green walls. You just drink your water, let me tell them. And then um, you know, it's the kind of part, like every Saturday night, you would know that, okay, you could end up at Stacey and Chin's house. You know, Saturday night, just come to my house. There's food, there's liquor, and there's fine ass women in the room, like lots of them all the time. And, you know, we have whole heap of fire escape stories and lap dances and like, you know, just, you know, it was a glorious time. Jesus was in that room. Um, and, 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 and she came to one of these parties. How old were you, Nicole? I, I was you were just coming from uh, like... 25. I was really like... I was, I was just moving... I just moved from Michigan, actually. Right. Right. And I met Diane, Dion. Uh -huh. 
and that was how it's like oh there's a cool party mm -hmm. it's Stacey and Chin's party first of all I lost my mind because this was remember <laughs> this was the same Stacey and Chin I saw in college and I was blown away and starstruck and all these things mm. so when she said oh it's Stacey and Chin's party I was like absolutely however as soon as I walked through the door I froze I was like I'm not going in here I saw those women I, I was like these poor lesbians that was, that's what we call them poor lesbians you know they were like <laughs> they were like established authors um, who, never that, that 25 year old girl had she been in here right now she was like who, who and, is but, that they, on, but they weren't thing? doing established author like, things no, exactly so we were right, talking mad shit and like wine. drinking wine and like right. sitting on each other's laps and just exactly. you like, know how what? lesbians can be when they're single and it's like on top of everybody walking by it's like, I was blown away yes was we're just away. close yes should I tell them what you said to me or no yes I mean tell I mean I'm, yes. so Stacey and she looked at me and she's like you're too shy to be a lesbian <laughs> And I was like, what does, what does that mean, shy to be a lesbian? And so of course, I, like, of course right. I send this woman b gone back into like her head, but what does it mean? What does right. it mean? I, I was like, I had no idea. First of all, I had no problems getting women before that. However, when she said, oh, oh excuse me, baby. <laughs> but when she said that, I was like, wait there, what does that mean? But at the same time, I was, I was writing then, but I wasn't really like uh, expressing myself. Mm -hmm. I was, nobody knew I was a writer. I was mostly like doing our, my research. I was mm -hmm. like, Columbia working and so I just started writing more so really in terms of my own voice and coming into myself my own identity it was through writing mm -hmm. I found that I so admire people who can like have thoughts and keep it to themselves oh gosh well yeah <laughs> I just had no confidence at the time. I was like, well, what am I going to go no, up but on stage? But, like, but there or you were, like, creating these, like, two amazing books that people talk about all the time. Me now, I have half an idea. I just, like, write a whole thing. I'm having a whole conversation. I'm under the tree telling everybody about it before I even figure out I, what it is that I want to well, do with it. Yeah, I commend you on that. And first of all, when I met you, you were one of my inspirations. I mean, there's you, there's Audre Lorde, there's Pat Parker, who you actually you mentioned hear the in crowd. your book. You hear the crowd, you put me in? <laughs> Say it again. I mean, Say it again. <laughs> yes. 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 So you, Stacey and Chin, Audre Lorde, Pat Parker. You know, those women, I mean, when you, when you first, even like Audre Lorde saying, saying our silences won't protect us, mm -hmm. that, that spoke to me. Oh, yeah, and that's but, definitely, but I live by on, that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just like write, just start writing against those things that we just talked about. Were you, you know? a reader as a kid? Uh, definitely, yes. yes. I, books yeah. saved me, man. Yeah. And like, I mean, some of the books that saved me, I'm like, Jesus Christ, how in God's name? I read Anne of mm -hmm. Green Gables like the other day when I was an adult, The Damn Thing Racist. It is so fucking racist, but like this orphan girl who like, you know, went and she got found this family. Cause you know, I was like an orphan for a long time in my head. And I was like, oh, I just waiting for somebody to come and adopt me and like save me from this fucking life of poverty. And like, somebody gonna take me away to somewhere and save my ass. And so you're reading all these fucking books like David Copperfield, you're reading like Great Expectations, Pip, the whole Are you of them. reading any Caribbean writers back in the day? Yes, I okay. read, um, I, I, I mean, I read everything though like um Creek Crack Monkey. Okay. I uh, read, um, I was reading Edwidge Dantica. What? I was reading. Um, Wait, no, when you're growing up. Not growing up, but like maybe when I was like uh, a little bit older. When okay, I was growing okay. up, I read like um, uh, Escape to Last Man Speak. Okay. Um, I've never heard what, of that. Jean Rees? Is it Jean Rees? Yeah. White, white, oh God, white sargas to see. I would just, mm. and then I was like, Shake, we're reading Shakespeare, well, reading all of, course, of the dead yeah. white men, right? Right, um, T.S. Eliot, you know, I'm like, yeah. I'm the only fucking like 14 year old walking to people back, let us go, then you and I, <laughs> then the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized uh -huh. upon a table. They're like, what's wrong with this fucking girl? <laughs> what is she saying? But like, you know, I was yeah. that girl reading, I mean, but I read. Every, I read Lisa, Linda Lovelace's The Ordeal when I was nine. Mm. You know what that is? She's, the, she's the, the, the woman who did Deep Throat and then she wrote about it oh, as yes. a, The Ordeal she wrote about. It. I was reading that shit like at oh, nine. Did you get that book at nine? You know, I lived a very unsupervised life oh. for a long time. <laughs> okay, <I was> like, <laughs> wow, Stacey. And, and then I didn't read like the last like 15 pages because the book didn't tear up. 
and the 15 pages were missing. So it was only in my adulthood that I got a hold of the book and read the last 15 pages. But it's about this woman who was um, basically held captive, like in the uh, like in the, the porn industry as a sex slave. Um, but I mean, like, but I read everything. I was reading. Um, I remember as a teenager, I found um, uh, Toni Morrison's. Uh, is it Tar Baby? Oh, you wait. You, you found Tar Baby. I found Beloved. Yeah, I, high school. Yeah, I think I read Beloved when when maybe I was in college, um, and I read like the poetry of Lorna Goodison when I was like growing up. I mean. Mm. I read like a lot of shit, like any, I, I mean, I didn't have, a, you know, these kids now who are readers, their parents can just get them what they're interested in. But, you know, we were poor, so I read anything that anybody had. Like, you know, if I was taking a crap in the bathroom, I'd be reading like the ingredients in a lotion. I had to be reading all the time, all the time, all the time. I read stories and the Harley Quinn romances. Oh, well, yes. Jesus so that, yes, have mercy. He school. plunged his male hardness into yes, her quivering yes. softness. <laughs> Guilty pleasures. Yeah, I mean, like, I read, like, so many. You see yeah. everybody nodding, because you know yeah. what I mean. The Mills and Boone that your mother just leave Boone. around. Yeah. You said Lenny's And then you says, you skip, ta- you, you skip past the sardonic gaze and the, the heated, like, the fire, the, the crackling of, like, energy between them to, like, the plunging of right. the... Right. <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Those were days. And so I have one last question, given that it's, um, it's time. Mm-hmm. But you know, this th- this book, for example, please, I would definitely love for you guys to get this book. But a lot of book for forgiveness. I feel like uh, there is this um, like full circle for you, where you know, um, you know, there are a lot, there's a lot of pain for sure, and you know, we talk about sex a lot. But then there is this one poem. Um, there's this one part in the poem that you just read, turning thirty. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to read it aloud um, just to remind the audience. Um, it says, sacrifice is the only way we know how to say I love you to our daughters. I raised my fist for me, for my mother who had the courage to leave. So can you talk about those lines? Like what kind of emotional work you had to do to arrive at that place to write them? Enough therapy. Enough, mm. enough, enough, enough therapy. And I mean, I became a feminist and how are we going to be a feminist? All these women, it's amazing how our interconnected stories like help us to move forward personally. Like my... Um, I had all these Caribbean women who had abandoned their children in Jamaica, in St. Lucia, in Trinidad, yeah. who came up to me and said, my God, like I left my own daughter and I, I, I really intended to go back to, for her or, yeah, I thought that she was okay with my grandmother and just all kinds of ways in which, and I would like have such empathy for them because I was kind of like talking to this room of women who I was like a feminist and I was like making room for all stories. And then as I grew older, I realized I wasn't really making story, making room for my own mother's failures because I mean my own hurt was standing in the way and you know I've 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 made a steady journey through therapy I mean Hope Tan has become a therapist so you should take his card and go to him <laughs> to be therapied um, you know he's 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 of color and an immigrant so he would you know understand all of your problems um, but there's a way that um, there's a way that I had to through therapy and through my own kind of like growth had to start making room for the fact that my mother's my mother's I don't want to call them failures but my mother's difficulties Mm -hmm. didn't have anything to do with me Mm -hmm. that I was in a weird kind of way like in in a strange this strange, this is very strange every time I say it, but I believe it with all my heart. What would have happened to my mother had she had the freedom to have an abortion when she didn't want to be a parent? How would that have changed her life? And how would that have changed her own agency in the world and given her a chance for a different kind of life in the world? Um, so there's therapy and, you know, my own life is not terrible. Um, like, I feel like I've chosen a good life and I like my life. And so it's really difficult to be bitter when you have worked really hard to have a life that you enjoy and that you feel good in. Mm-hmm. To be, and like, when you're angry and bitter, it's like, it, like I'm so angry and bitter about Trump. And, and I, I, I'm resentful of the fact that that I carry this anger and bitterness around me every day and every time I open the news that my every ounce of generosity leaves my body, just seep out of my body like pee. 
Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, because I try to live like a positive kind of like life that, I, you know, I have good friends and leave people with good feelings and every day I'm just angry at this situation. But with my own mother, and then, you know, I just happen to have the most perfect child on the planet. And I know she going to fuck me up in the teenage years because she's been so freaking perfect so far. But for now, like, she's remarkably kind and fierce. And she's kind of teaching me that you don't have to be, like, on some other level, that you could be both kind and fierce at the same time. That you could be fierce, you could hold your boundaries, and you could be kind. Like, a kid would hit her on the playground and her response to it. I'm like, did I make you angry? Did you want to hit him back? And she's like, no, it just hurt my feelings. And the last living room protest we did, um, she was talking about the fact that she, um, I was surprised because we had been in Montreal and she asked a kid to play and the kid was like, no, I don't want to play. And then she kind of just skipped away and then just went in her, on her way. And I was talking to her about it afterwards and she was like, no, it didn't hurt my feelings. And then I, in the living room protest, I was asking her to explain why. And she went round and around. She goes, well, maybe he plays with a lot of friends and maybe just wanted to play by himself today. Or maybe he was like, um, you know, maybe some people just don't want to play that day or maybe they're in a bad mood or they're not in the mood to make a new friend. And then and at the end, she was like, well, you know, I just think you have to let people choose whether they want to be friends with you or not. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. And it happened like... I mean, you know, we didn't talk about it beforehand. She kind of came up with it herself. And she's kind of like that. And those of you who know her know. And as I say, she's going to fuck me up in the teenage years because there's no way that she can be this smooth now. <laughs> and then she's not going to, like, stab me in the neck <laughs> when she's 15. So I'm, I'm prepared for it. You know, I know it's coming. But, but you know, I, but for, for now, she just is so, like, sweet. And she wears all of her feelings. And she... She has a feeling, and then it's sad, and then it's, you know, and then she'll like weep, and I'll be like, do you need a hug? No, I just need to be by myself and calm down. And then she'll calm down, and then she'll come out and be like, okay, I'm sorry I was like harsh with you earlier. Like she's, v that's what I'm saying. Like, and, you know, and, and I think to myself, like, this is what we look like before we're broken. Like all of us were like that maybe. And this is what you look like before like the world fucks you the fuck up. Do you know what I mean? Before all the things come in and like break you in pieces. Like and you know, I live in like perpetual horror of the day when something happens that makes her not this. Mm. And you know, th that time you wanna like just wrap her in bubble wrap and keep her in the house and they, they don't move, but you can't do that because according to the movie Nemo, if you, nothing happens to them then nothing will happen to them. <laughs> Um, but it, I mean, I, I guess we want to say that it's just, it's a struggle, right? Yeah. To just be healthy and right. good. You know, I, and I know you probably thought that was weird. But I was like, oh, I think because you know, um, Patsy, you know, leaves her daughter behind yes. in Jamaica. Yes, yes, you know, yes, yes, yes. Abundance. Yes. So when I was telling Stacey and Sheena about the book, because I think you had the answer, we were talking about Patsy. Mm -hmm. and I was like, oh my god! But after reading um, Crossfire, mm -hmm. and then of course the memoir, I was like, oh my goodness. So I mean, I kind of fumbled my way through explaining what Patsy's about to you, knowing your history. But it is, but it's it's so amazing to have like one different stories about abandonment. Mm -hmm. Because we are in an era of like crazy migration because of like the economic, the global economic setup. Yeah. Like people and climate change only gonna make it worse, you know, because crops are dying and like things are shifting and so people are moving, people are crossing borders in or for clean water and, you know, for a, a way to make a living and to eat and to be safe, and so, like the migration story is multifarious. It is like. It's crazy different, and I'm uh, like, so I think the more we write about and the more perspectives we have right. in those storytelling, in that kind of storytelling, the, m the more truthful a canon we have about this era of migration. Mm. I mean, okay. and, and the borders, and you know, I, I am yeah. grateful for your, your, your books that tell the story from a place of, um, of, 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 of like just multiple identities, like you know, the queer, the black, the immigrant, the woman. Like, I'm I'm grateful that you tell those stories and that pe people can like f see themselves in it, but be a little bit removed from it. 
so that they can interact with the ideas. Yeah. You know, it, it's amazing that people can still interact with the ideas that are so difficult and so, and they, 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 they so deeply live in our bones and cause us pain, you know? Definitely. And last question before the audience. How, oh, sorry. Oh, you know what? I'm getting mm -hmm. carried away here. Let me open up to the audience and then I'll ask just, just in case. So any questions from the audience? And don't feel pressure. You don't have to ask not Nadine. <laughs> Yeah, of course. <laughs> All right, go on. Have you forgiven your mom? I, it's a, that's a, that, I think that's a... It, it, for me to say yes or no would be an oversimplified answer to that. Mm -hmm. Because the things that happened to me because of her absence, because of her choices, still remain with me. You know, I can still wake up like mid-orgasm, like sobbing, and that has to do with like abandonment and being open and being vulnerable and all that shit. Like, I mean, I still look at my daughter with some amount of envy, like, this little wretch just having such a great life. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you know, did she know that in Jamaica I had to make my own pads? <laughs> do you know what I mean? But, but I don't want her to make her own pads, but I want her to be grateful that she not make, but she don't have no concept <laughs> of me. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, um... You know, so she's like, you know, what the, she watch me carry like the bag in the winter. Like I have like six grocery bags and her bag that I had to tell her not to carry because she not went carry it herself. And then I have her bag and then it's winter. I have a park like six blocks from the house. I'm walking. Then she's like, I'm so tired. Can you pick me up? I'm like, Jesus Christ, you see me with 18 bags and it's winter and I'm like doing the best I can. And you are now 40 pounds. Come on. And but then I have to remember that. I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't think that it can be as, you know, this notion, and maybe what it is is my, my, my imagination of forgiveness is so limited. Um, and so maybe I have forgiven her, but I'm still, like, wearing the, the stains of her choices and her actions in my life, and I will for the rest of my life. Um, you know, the fact that I can't, you know, Nic Nicole, how long you on this person in a relationship <laughs> how long now? so i've been dating emma well 11 years now married for seven years you see what i mean yeah. like this is what healthy look like i can't hold on to nobody for more than like three or four years you know like before they leave me or before i i expel them from my life it's, maybe i need to come and see hope done about this very issue <laughs> But, you know, I mean, my, my inability to kind of sustain relationships has to do with my mother and her leaving and how I expect people to leave me. And I want them to leave me because that's more familiar than having them stay because the work of staying, Jesus Christ, you know the work. Those of you who are in long-term relationships, you know how much work it requires to stay in there. I see you and I'm like, often I say to myself, I'm glad I don't have a partner because Jesus have mercy. But it's a lot of work, you know what I mean? Um, but and then when you are when you are abandoned, you imagine that the work of being in long term relationships is not hard, <laughs> because you make up this fantasy about how oh if I had a family it'd be so good and they would just support me about everything I know and they would love me and they would just be like okay maybe they might be a little bit uncomfortable with my being queer for like a year but then after that they're like so excited about me and my queerness and they love my partner and they support me and those of you with families are laughing your asses off because you know it don't go like that. And so the work, I mean, so my inability to be in a partnership for a long time, um, my like sensitivity around people thinking like, like rejection, like I'm just in awe of Zuri who can hear, I don't want to play with you and be fine. No, if Alison tell me she don't want to play with me, I vex with her for about 10 years. <laughs> and every time we in public together, I'd be like, you remember that time you didn't want to play with me? Do you know? <laughs> And that has to do with like my shit about like my emotionality, and that's my mother gave that to me. You know what I mean? And I carry it with me, and I have to work so hard to like not just do that every time somebody said they don't want to play with me. And sometimes it's not playing with me. Sometimes it's like I don't want to date you, and I'm like, what do you mean you don't want to date me? <laughs> my mother abandoned me. You have to date me. <laughs> Anyone else? Go ahead. Yeah. For you, for your entire life, but when did you come to writing? For both um, of you, I started writing some really awful poems when I was um, maybe in college, like um, maybe second. I mean, I was still trying to ape the language of like T. S. Eliot and John Donne, and maybe write about the things that they were writing about. And I think that I didn't. I wanted to write then, but I didn't quite know. I didn't have like a a mandate 
to write. But when I landed in America, and then I was like, shit, I'm gay. I don't live nowhere. I don't belong anywhere. My country don't want me. This new country that I've chosen don't really want me. I don't belong here. I'm having all of these difficulties. And it cold. Like, I definitely came up with, like, a, a mandate to write. Because all of a sudden, I had, like, things that felt as if they were, like, real struggles. Which is strange, because, I mean, I had real struggles before. But, I mean, the, the, I guess the question of not belonging somewhere is a really deep question that... in. That yeah, that's how I came to writing as well. Homesickness, you know, that was how I started writing. In fact, I started with poetry first. Mm -hmm. I was a failed poet. I was terrible. And then the poetry that's started not, getting... You just don't reach there yet, but oh, it, you know trust what? me. <laughs> it started getting longer and longer and longer. Next thing I know, I'm writing stories. But it was really helping me to cope with homesickness. I wasn't in the best situation. I lived with my father, and, you know, that home situation was terrible. So that was really helping. Writing and reading mm -hmm. helped a lot in terms of escape. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, it, you know, um, as I say, I write from a place of I want people to, I want to make them uncomfortable. So that's why I say motherfucker so much and pussy. And you know what I mean? Like just make people just yeah. wake them up out of their seats. <laughs> you know, especially when you speak to college kids, you're like, okay, you say like fuck, fuck, fuck and sex, sex, sex. And they're like, ooh, this is going to be good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they pay attention. They can slip some like real like knowledge in there <laughs> on the sly. She was on a dating show. Oh. You remember? Oh, the Chris? She, she's a Jamaican lesbian who was like dating. Some, what's his show name, Chris? Dating Around. Dating it. Around. You must find it on YouTube when Netflix. she was. Netflix. Net, sorry. It's all right. <laughs> I don't know these things. Um, that's okay. So, so you mentioned being abandoned, right? And like you, my mother left me when I was 13. I'm 30 now and I haven't physically seen my mother in, in that amount of time. I think that's like 17 years if my math is correct. Um, I would just like to say that one of the things that helped me to move past that is the fact that I realized my mother didn't have the tools. Mm -hmm. You know, what is abandonment to her when in her head she's leaving her child with her mother? Yes, to go find bread so you could go to school and thing, you know, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my, when I looked at that, it made it a little bit easier for me to understand where she was coming from, noticing that my mother had me when she was 16. She turned 17 later on in that same mm -hmm. year. And my mother didn't have the tools that I now have For sure. as an adult. And then when you take into consideration the fact that my grandmother was illiterate. So then I had to tell myself, I really can't be mad at this woman because she wasn't a woman. She didn't know what she was doing. You know what I mean? And, and so it, it was easy for me to take the step and say, all right, there's nothing to forgive because what wrong did she cause she didn't know what she was doing mm. you know what i mean mm -hmm. so that sort of kind of helped me that was not a question it was it's more like a, a know, comment like a i mean and it's a part of the shared discussion of like you know how we heal for sure i mean i i which is why i posed the question earlier that if she had had an abortion then you know she wouldn't have to be asking nobody forgiveness because she didn't want to be a parent so now just because she didn't want to be a parent and she was forced to become a parent that she must spend the rest of her life apologizing for how she mismanaged the thing that she didn't want in the first place. That's like some fucked up shit. Five minutes? Five minutes. So we have two questions. Quick, quick. Back of the room now? Um, I have a question because these sort of um, settings, it's, I think it's really important for people of color, especially black women, to sort of come and hear about common experiences. But I also have a question on, like, shouldn't these spaces, like the things that you both are saying in your books, shouldn't it be more open to, like, white people should be hearing this as well? Because white people should be doing a lot more of things. They, but we they do, should we, be here. We're and working listening. real hard to get them to exactly, do them, but they're not this seem is to. Like yeah. Preaching to the choir, you know. We're like, failing miserable at getting them in the rooms. They're that not they need coming. To hear. I, they're <laughs> not coming. So, like, I, I mean, I don't. I, I, you know, this is you're asking me the impossible question here: how to get white people to come to the conversation yeah. about real change and how to be. Yeah, I mean, we we've we've also been like. Um, I have a line in a poem that w the Donald J. Trump is not my president, um, where he said that, like, steady, all the other white men who believe that equal opportunity for anyone else means we are trying to motherfucking oppress them. Like, that's the, 
the privilege conversation, there, there are ways in which like when I am called on my privilege, whatever it is, whether it's class or whether it's like a question of like, you know, the transgendered community is remarkably vulnerable just now. And so when they called me out on not being transgender, or they called me out on a whole bunch of things, like I get mad defensive. It's like, what do you mean? I'm a lesbian, my mother abandoned me, you know? <laughs> what do you mean? I have no money, I'm a single mom, I, you know, what do you mean, what do you mean? Can you imagine what it's like to like even have like far more privilege and then somebody calling you on it? Because if we were to right the wrong of inequality, it really means, people like to say, oh, we're not gonna have less, but they're gonna have less because they can't just like take the whole fucking world in terms of land mass as theirs. So they're gonna have less if we were to have more. And we're not addressing that. Like w once I was running a workshop in, at Dartmouth, where they bring me in and they have like, you know, maybe somebody put a news somewhere or somebody says some shit and they quick, quick call somebody black to come in to have a conversation so that <laughs> they can know that they have like, you know, and this happens in all of the like white liberal spaces. They quick, quick call somebody black. We're like, come, come, come. Can you just come and say something black? And then we just, <laughs> we know that we're like covered. So I'm having this conversation and between the, um, between the, the, the black students and the white students and uh, of course, invariably, we have some weeping white woman. Um, and this is like a really like big issue because, you know, ne you know, I, this is not really like a mammy situation, but like I call it like a pammy, like where, yeah. where uh, you know, I'm in a conversation with like a white woman who's like deeply distraught about like the impasse that we're at. And uh, next thing you know, she weeping and I'm patting her. Do you know, like it's a very like uncomfortable setup, but it happens all the time, all the time, all the time, because you know, white people have more room to be more human, and so they can bawl when they feel sad. <laughs> and we, you know, whereas we just get angry because we don't have no room to be sad because nobody gonna pat us. Everybody be like, "What's wrong with you? You're just bawling and putting your snout all over the good white floor." You know, <laughs> so so this woman, and this two, two people are arguing and cussing each other and going on about like race and reparations. And then this white girl was like, "So what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I don't know what to do. I want to be a part of the solution. Can you tell me what to do?" And the black kid climbs up on the chair and said, "Give me back my shit." I want you to give me back my shit. The house you live in belongs to me and my ancestors. The clothes you're wearing, the money in your bank account, everything, give it back to me. And then the conversation was over because nobody wants to have that conversation. <laughs> nobody wants to have that conversation. And that's the reparation conversation nobody's trying to have. Um, so, and then it's hard for you know, white people. I, you know, I, at the same time, it's like when you pat men on the back and say, like, thank you very much for coming to the feminist conversation, it's the same way I feel about white people. Like, I need to hold your hand and tell you, please come back and please stay in the conversation. Because these conversations can be hard for you. But they're hard for us all the time. And even when you're not talking, it's hard for us. And so it's asking you to kind of step out of a space of safety that you can actually have and to choose to be in a, an unsafe environment with us. And that's a hard ask. And so maybe the best thing I do is like I acknowledge it as much as I can, but I'm not gonna step back from the conversation because stepping back from the conversation means that we're not having it. Um, and then, you know, like, you know, I give them practical ways. Like, if you're white and you're rich, buy five books and give them away. You know, like, these are real ways that you can support women of color. Like, I mean, you know, I don't know, like there are tons of ways you can like figure out how to be helpful to the community of color um, or people of color, like just, you know, affirm, like when the microaggression happens at work, don't just come meet me in the bathroom and tell me how it was horrible. Don't fucking do that. In the moment, stand with me and say that is not correct, that's not right. Don't meet me in the bathroom. I don't want to hear from you post the event. If you didn't say anything in the moment, do not motherfucking bomber cloth say one word to me afterwards because you piss me off more. Because then I know you understood what happened and you still didn't make room to stand by me in public. So are, are we done done now or? Yeah, one more, yes. Thank you. 
based on both of you being there, this was really powerful to me. Nicole told me actually that she was going to be speaking to you, and I knew I wanted to be here today. One of the things I thought about with reading Patsy, because I just finished reading Patsy, and you telling when you read the first poem, or was it the second, when you spoke about your mom, mm. your mom leaving, did you read, wanted to ask you, did you read Patsy, Stacey? I haven't read it yet, no, okay. no. Then the question would have been about that, because I wondered how you felt you would you know about Patsy if you read it because Nicole had mentioned at another reading how so many people were so angry at Patsy mm -hmm. and I think because they could connect with it in some way or mm. just even the thought of a mother leaving because it was always where fathers left and that was okay mm -hmm. but when mothers left it became a different conversation you know there, yeah. there is definitely that my mother gets yeah. a lot of flack I mean people yeah. say but no one ever asked me have you forgiven your father Yes, yeah, and I that, absolutely that never get came, that. He yeah. never came forward and he was in Jamaica, living in a nice house right. with a nice family and he never came and took me and had me in his house and no one has ever asked me if I have forgiven my father, my father. but it is so common for people to ask me there's something mm -hmm. to forgive my mother for but it doesn't even come up that my father needs forgiveness and I wanted to touch on something you saying that because another thing when you spoke about just I'm, I'm from Jamaica as well and I'm 50 so we are close to maybe close to the same age. You're a few years younger than I am. And so we grew up maybe around the same. Did you go to Immaculate? I went to Mount Alverne, the Mount Alverne version of Immaculate. Yes, because yes. When, so you said the white the, uniform. Yeah, when you said the white uniform and blue tie, I was poking my friend Dave and saying, I think she went to the same high school I went to. But one of the things that in a sense to that growing up in Jamaica, and I speak to friends about it, and friends from Jamaica, we, you know, we share the same, this kind, the similar conversation about, it felt like our bodies weren't ours exactly. no, when we sure. were children, because sure. I remember, and I wasn't able to express it so much at that time, because it was everyday thing, you know, where you'd get on the bus, and I'm 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, and I'm standing on the bus, obviously a little girl, I'm holding on, you know, on the bus, whatever, and if the bus is, bus is crowded, you'll feel somebody shift over to you. And like I mean some that, man, I mean like. But you, that goes across like cultures as well. That yes, happens to absolutely. girls here on the subway. Those yes, of you who grew up here in New York, I mean, it happens I'm all sure. the time. I mean, all kinds of shit. And then men would call out to us publicly, like, psst, what sexy girl, way ass, the whatever it is, and you know, all kinds of things, and across the street, but nobody said anything. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, at, and it the, happens in see, South Africa, yes. it happens in Nigeria. No, but I mean, I'm saying that growing up there, I never realized even so much that it was a problem mm. until getting older and you started to have conversations about yes. it. So I think it's amazing that you're both here and that I'm sitting here across from both of you. And I think it's amazing that we are having conversations. For sure. Like thank getting you so together much for and being having here. honest conversations. All right. And thank you, Nicole, for telling me about this. So I could be here. Are, are we going straight to signing now? Is that what's happening? Yeah, because you know this bookstore is not just here because of the goodness of their heart. <laughs> they want you to buy a book. For those of you who have already bought it, you should buy another one. <laughs> For those of you who feel guilty about like you know uh, what's happening to people of color in the world, you should buy five <laughs> and send them to people. I mean. Um, but thank you very much for, for coming. Thank um, you both so much. Thank you. And, and, thank and you. mad love to, I mean, because what is Monday is your holiday. You take your time to come out here and sit down with us. Isn't, isn't it like Indigenous People Day today? Yeah, you would never catch me with that, man. You know, you can't catch me. Just <laughs> set me up with that figure, said a man name. <laughs> But thank you both so much. Books are for sale at the register. Please buy a copy, buy multiple copies, get them signed. And if you've bought one already, we're happy to sign <laughs> anything you have. Um, Same. Thank you so much. Thank you.